Good morning, people of God. We're going to hover over the first chapter of Philippians, one for a little bit longer, before we start into chapter two, because I have a few things I would like to say about uh, between verses, uh, what am I looking at? Oh, verses um, 18, 18, uh, 18 over to verse 30. So we look, talked about that briefly last week, but I want to visit, revisit this. I want to revisit this because there are two things that are going. There's two things that are going on here, and we talked last week. We talked last week about. Uh, we talked about. You know, we learned that how Paul was saying, "If I die, I will be with Christ. If I live, I will be with Christ." And I uh, just want to bring another angle of what Paul is saying here for his congregation in Philippi. Okay. So, in order to do that, um, I'm going to turn in my Bible to 2 Corinthians. I'm going to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 8 through 11. And if you make, are taking notes, it's 2 Corinthians 1, verses 8 through 11. Um, this explains what's going on, and this is going to explain what Paul is trying to tell his congregation in Philippi when he says, for me to live is Christ, for me to die is to be with Christ. Whether I live or die, I am with Christ. All right. So let me just read first, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 8 through 11. For we do not want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, regarding the affliction that happened to us in the province of Asia, that we were burdened excessively beyond our strength, so that we despaired even of living. Indeed, we felt as if the sentence of death had passed against us, so that we would not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead. He delivered us from so great a risk of death, and he will deliver us. We have set our hope on him that he will deliver us yet again as you also join in helping us by prayer, so that many people may give thanks to God on our behalf for the gracious gift given to us through the help of many. This explains what, what Paul, um, Paul, yeah, Paul is talking about in the first chapter of Philippians, and these two passages need to be tied together, and then it'll, it will make sense what, what's happening here. Paul is describing his imprisonment. We feel that Paul is describing his imprisonment in Ephesus. Okay, this is where we believe he wrote the letter to Philippians. Um, one of the reasons is that Timothy is with him. Timothy is not with him when he's in Rome. Timothy is not there. So you have to find a place where is Timothy. And Timothy was with Paul when he was in Ephesus. And so we feel that he was interred. He was interred. Um, in prison in Ephesus for about two years. Okay, and he's describing this, this in 2 Corinthians, the first chapter, verses 8 through 11. He's saying to them, for we do not want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, regarding the affliction that happened to us in the province of Asia, that we were burdened excessively beyond our strength so that we despaired even of living. Indeed, we felt as if the sentence of death had been passed against us. There it is. So what is Paul, Paul is saying has had several hearings, but he has not yet been tried. The trial will be held in front of Caesar because as a Roman citizen, he has that privilege and he has invoked that privilege. I want Caesar to officiate on this. And that was one of the roles of the monarch. He would, this one would officiate. But he's had several hearings and these, there were hearings, and, and people were helping him in the book of Acts. Now that we've read the book of Acts, and we know the book of Acts, we know that he had several hearings, and Herod Agrippa was involved, Festus was involved, Felix was involved, and everyone was listening to the hearings and writing up the documentation that they would give Paul so that he could finally take it with him to Rome and present it to, to the emperor. Okay, So he, that's where the trial will be held. All right, but he's thrown into prison. Now, Philippi hears that Paul is in prison, this congregation in Philippi, and sends a donation. So whenever you hear of a gift in, the Paul, in Paul's letters, thank you for the gift, it's not a gift for the congregation, but it's a gift for, the, for Paul, because he's in prison and this money is used to purchase food. Okay? But understand, please understand, that life in the Roman Empire was cheap. 
Okay, life in the Roman Empire was cheap. And it was not unusual for somebody who was a troublemaker in order to, to finish the process or to end the troublemaking to be executed. Um, that was a common practice. So Paul was actually afraid that he might be executed before he had a trial. And who's gonna, who's gonna worry about it, you know? Well, he's a Roman citizen. Well, <laughs> that doesn't protect you from everything. Uh, you know, he's, you know, and he's getting in everybody, on everybody's nerves. And his public record is not stellar. Everywhere he goes, there's a riot. So if you have this record of being a troublemaker, a troublemaker, sometimes it's just easier, oh, let's take care of it. And in the dark of night, zhoop, we're done. Goodbye, so long, farewell, auf Wiedersehen, goodbye. Now peace will be restored. So Paul is afraid that he, since life in the Roman Empire is cheap, he could be executed without a trial, and that would be quite common. Okay? So he is uh, going through an existential crisis. He could lose his life at any moment, and nobody would care except the people in his congregations would care. And the people in his congregations might assume that everything has gone badly, that what has happened here was for no good re was, uh, there was nothing good that came out of this. In other words, circumstances sometimes overwhelm us to the point that we sometimes figure, why bother? Okay, so, you know, why bother? Why get concerned about the gospel? Why get concerned about, you know, all of these things? Life has overwhelmed me, I give up, okay? So we give up, we can give up. We get that feeling of being frustrated and alone, and we give up. So here we are, here we are in this, in this moment where Paul is very afraid, and he realizes He's got to give a word of encouragement to the congregations, particularly right now he would like to talk to Philippi, the congregation in Philippi. And so if you re we read this section in the first chapter of Philippians, the, the, for the, the ending section of chapter one, Paul is trying to encourage people, don't give up. Regardless of what happens to me, don't give up. If I am executed and I don't get to trial, it is not, does not mean, it does not mean that it, everything has gone badly. So here's a pastor, here is a pa the Paul the pastor, here is Paul the pastor who, who is giving, even in the dire circumstances, is turning to the congregation and giving them a word of hope. And that word of hope that he gave the congregation in the first century is a word of hope that can speak to us in the 21st century. Just because circumstances aren't going the way we would like it, and sometimes life overwhelms us with, with overwhelms us, please don't give up. It doesn't mean that everything has gone badly. Okay? So here's what he says. Yes. And I'm looking at Philippians, the first chapter, verse 18. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice. Now, when you read 1, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 8, he's like, he's been, he knows he's been, he has the sentence of death hanging over him. It may come at any moment before trial. So he is going through an existential crisis. Yes, I will continue to rejoice for that I, for I know that this will turn out for my deliverance. So deliverance is not deliverance from life, but deliverance from, from the problem. He's holding on to this. It's overwhelming him, but he's holding, deliverance is not from this life, but from the problems he's facing. I know, I know this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayers and the help of the Spirit, help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. My confident hope is that I will in no way be ashamed, but with complete boldness, even now as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether I live or die. 
because he understands the sentence of execution could be executed at any moment. So because he's a troublemaker, life in the Roman Empire is cheap. He doesn't want the congregation who's going to be very upset to say, well, let's give up. Throw the rag in, it's over with. For to me, living is Christ and dying is gain. Now if I am to go on living in the body, this will mean productive work for me. Yet I do not know which I prefer. I feel torn between the two because I have a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far, but it is more vital for your sake that I remain in the body. There's the key. That's what he's saying. Okay, this is nothing, this is nothing about, don't see this as um, about heaven. This is, this is about life. And to be frankly honest, we have very little understanding of heaven. Um, we just know that it means I'm with Christ. That's all I can say. What it means beyond that, I don't know. Uh, um, I have a few, few answers. I don't know the furniture of heaven. Okay, I don't. Um, and so, so, you know, that's it. I don't know the furniture. I don't know if we'll have Wi-Fi, Facebook, Zoom. I'm not sure. I don't know any of these things. I don't have the details. But what I do know is that Christ is there and that's all that matters. And that's what Paul has just said to this congregation who he's worried is going to worry about him and for him. But it is more vital for your sake that I remain in the body. And since I am sure of this, I know that I will remain and continue with all of you for the sake of your progress and joy in the faith. So if I live, I live here for you, all right? So that you, so that what you can be proud of may increase because of me in Christ Jesus when I come back to you. There it is. So whether I live or die, I am with Christ, but for me to live is helpful for you because I, this is a vital ministry. So he's passing this on as a word of confidence, not trying to, to, to um, say, uh, say all will be well. He knows it might not, and he doesn't want people to get frustrated and give up. Just because he may be executed does not mean it's a loss. And so he's, he's encouraging them. Then he says to them, he says, only conduct yourselves in a manner, manner, manner worthy of the gospel of Christ in that whether I come and see you or whether I remain absent, I should hear that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind by contending side by side for the faith of the gospel. So what is his task for the congregation? What is our task in the 21st century as we battle things that we don't understand? We don't give up hope. We don't give up hope. We continue. We stand with one another in the 21st century, shoulder to shoulder, just as our spiritual ancestors stood shoulder to shoulder in the first century. And we, pro we proclaim the gospel, the good news of Christ, the good news. All right. So there it is. We have one mind by contending side by side for the faith of the gospel and by not being intimidated in any way by your opponents. There's another piece. Don't get intimidated by them. Don't let your enemies, your opponents intimidate you. You know, it's sort of like meeting a strange dog. Okay, that's the way I can, how I would describe this in a sermon because all of us have had that moment. We don't know this dog. What should we do? We were always told, don't run and don't be afraid because they'll know it. And <laughs> they'll try to figure out what's going on and scare us more. We can identify with that. Shake your head yes if you can identify with what I've just said. Yes. Don't run. Don't be afraid. My mother said, they'll smell it. <laughs> and they will. <laughs> and so... Paul is saying to Christians in the first century, don't be intimidated by them because they'll know it. And so he's, he's it's, it's like meeting a strange dog. Dog, be yourself. All right? There it is. So, and by not being intimidated in any way by your opponents, this is a sign of their destruction, but of your salvation, a sign which is from God. For it has been granted to you not only to believe in Christ, but also to suffer for him, since you are encouraging the same conflict that you saw me face and now hear that I am facing. So when conflict comes, when we're in, we doubt, we have questions. Great, fine. We take them to God in prayer. 
We share them with one another. We pray for one another. Then we stand firm, united in one mind, together, side by side, and keep going because they are watching us. We're looking for signs from God. Well, look in the mirror. All right? That's what Paul is saying to the Philippians and to himself. He's preaching to himself. And trust me, any pastor that's worth their salt is preaching to themselves. Okay? We're preaching to ourselves, you know, because I figure if I'm having this, you may be also. So if I find a word of comfort and the gospel and the good news and something, let me tell you about it. All right? So there it is. Should we do this? Do, must we do this? Do we have to do this? No. That's Lutheranism. No. But we have the privilege and honor of doing this. Will we, we be judged if we get frustrated and throw in the towel? No. No. You know, that's what I was trying to say on Sunday when I said Peter denied Jesus, but he received the sacrament that, that night. Judas betrays him, but he still receives. Thomas will doubt him. He still receives. And please know this. Please hear this. When Jesus was resurrected, none of the disciples went looking for him. When they knew the resurrection had occurred, they scattered even further and stayed behind locked doors. Jesus had to go find them. And, okay? Was Paul looking for Jesus on the road to Damascus? No. Jesus had to go find them. There is salvation. Who starts salvation? God. Who finishes salvation? God. There's the gospel. It starts, it finishes with God. We did not find God. That's impossible. God finds us. And so Paul is saying, you know, your, your opponents are watching you. So we have started, God found us. We are with God. We bear witness to this. We keep going. We encourage one another. We strengthen one another. We do these things. This is it. And that's what this passage in Philippians is all about. He's trying to give them a word of encouragement when it looks like everything is going the wrong way. And so he's just saying, here we can do this. This is how, this is how I see this. And he's encouraged by this, and he wants to do is give that encouragement to his congregation. All right. Thank you for inviting me to your computer screens, into your homes, and I wish you a great, a great weekend. Uh, great weekend. Happy Labor Day. It's right Thank around you. the corner. Yes. You. Mm -hmm. There it is. Happy Labor Day. Mm -hmm. Stay you. safe, Thank everyone. You. Stay Thank you, you. church. God bless. God bless. God bless. God bless. Bye bye. God bless. Bye. Bye bye. Bye. -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye.